Hello everyone, this is Pastor Stephen coming to you with Friday's devotional. Uh, this week we've been talking about this covenant between Abram and the Lord God. And we talked about mostly about the promises the first four days. This time I actually want to talk about the actual covenant. And during this time in this 2000 BC time frame, these covenants, uh, we call them in historically suzerain vassal treaties uh, or suzerain vassal covenants. And essentially what this was, was basically, typically, a king, let's say a king came down, defeated a city, or defeated another nation, he would basically take the leader of that city and essentially force him into this, this covenant to serve this greater king, right? And so what it would look like would be would, that after the defeat, he would they would cut a bunch of animals in half, like lengthwise, and um, the the greater king, the one who defeated uh, the uh, the lesser nation, would have the the vassal, which that that lesser king, walk through that uh, those those bisected animals, and in doing so, the that vassal, this the person who was defeated, essentially would be saying, if I don't. Uh, Confer, if I don't follow through with this oath to serve you, then may I be like one of these animals. So that's essentially what this treaty was um, and how, how it was commonly affected. And Abram knew Abram knew this. He knew how to, to walk through, the, as you see the scripture, he, he already knew what this is all about and that God was establishing a covenant. But what, what the Lord did was it turned this, he turned this covenant on his head. Instead of Abram walking through, he, God himself walked through. And I wanted to um, I liked this excerpt from a, a homily by David Bentley Hart. He um, discusses this actual uh, situation, and I, I want to read it because it's so beautiful how he expressed it, um, and I think you'll you'll be moved by it. He says this, But in the story of Abram's covenant, it isn't Abram who walks between the beasts, is it? Abram doesn't say, May I be killed if I break my promises to God. No, amazingly, it is the Spirit of God who passes through the bisected animals. God cuts the covenant, not Abram. In the midst of a darkness most terrible, the fire of God appears and proclaims, not in words, but in deed, I will be with you. I will be faithful to you, and I will keep every single one of my promises to you. And yet more than these, even if it kills me, God here promises brothers and sisters, to be faithful to us even unto death, not simply our death, but his own. Faithful to this covenant, faithful to this relationship, even if it kills him. Faithful to us, even if we kill him. See, a covenant is not a contract. It's much more open-ended than that, he says. A covenant is a promise, a, a faithful relationship, no matter what. Imagine the source of all being, the one true God, most high, who created and sustains all things in the entirety of existence, proclaiming aloud, I love the silly old man who, whom I have made so much that I will lay down everything I am and everything I have just to love him, to abide in him, to be faithful to him forever. It's insane. When we talk about being heirs of Abraham, my brothers and sisters, this is what we're talking about. Not the bloodlines of Isaac and Ishmael, but a promise so powerful that the very author of life would lay down his life out of love for us. How does this even make sense? It's ridiculous, too extravagant, too impossible to believe. You'd have to be the, a crazy old man even to entertain the notion, yet by God it's true. More than 2,000 years later, the same God appeared to Abraham, became one of us, and our Creator entered his creation through the womb of the Virgin Mary. He came to keep his promises, not simply to save the family of Abram from Rome, but to save all the nations of the earth from our far deeper and eternal slavery to sin, death, and hell. He came to walk amongst us as he once did in the Garden of Eden before the fall before we betrayed him and broke the world, he came to love us, to forgive us, and to reconcile us to his own eternal life. And he did all this knowing full well that we would react in fury and fear, that we would nail him to a cross and murder him for the unmitigated gall of proclaiming our sins forgiven. He knew what loving us would cost him. 
He always knew. From the beginning of time, he knew what we would do to him. And he came anyway, because our God promised to love us, even if it killed him. Isn't that beautiful? I love how that's expressed. We, we sang a song on Sunday called uh, Reckless Love. And, and not that recklessness is, is careless love. No, that can be interpreted a different way. But this, so, this sort of extreme kind of love the Lord showed us is beyond understanding. That the king of the universe will go to such lengths to express his love for his creation. What a good God we serve, church. What a good God who loves us, who calls us to himself, to be with him, to be transformed by him, to become more like him. This is the God we serve. This is the God who loves us. So Lord, we just come before you now and give you thanks. Thanks for the love that you have shown us. Thanks for the the extreme ways you went to show us that love, Lord. That you have given us such hope in that love. The hope, Lord, that is in that love is goes greater and deeper and higher and wider than anything we could imagine. And nothing can separate us from that love. Lord, you made it so that this covenant is unbreakable because you are the one who did, who instituted it. You are the one who walked through it for our sakes because you loved us so dearly. I pray, Lord, this day, this weekend, our lives, really, we would reflect on your love and give thanks to you for it, Lord. We ask, God, that our lives would, in response, love you back. We give you thanks, Lord, for all that you've done for us. Our mighty God, we give you praise. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.